The last time I did an update on my specialised Fatboy was shortly after upgrading the controller to the ASI Back 800. It made a huge difference to the bike at 52 volts. Since then I've upgraded the battery to allow it to run on 72 volts, as well as a few other quality of life changes. I get a lot of questions on the setup, so this will be a quick and dirty overview of the bike and then a look at the main questions I get asked, which are mostly concerning the nylon gear in the BBS HD and wear and tear on the mechanical components and frame. The frame is a Specialized Fatboy 2017 model. When I first got it, it had carbon forks and I've replaced those with the RockShox Bluto. I've enjoyed the ride a lot more with the suspension forks on the front. It's a pretty standard aluminum frame and I chose it because reviews said it had very stable geometry suitable for a wide range of conditions and that's proved to be the case. I have over 5,000 kilometers on it as an e-bike and a few thousand more as a regular bike pre-conversion. It is a very solid, well-made frame and I am not experiencing any flex on it at all, even on full throttle at 72 volts. So the brakes are the Tektro hydraulic brakes that the bike came with. They're not the world's best hydraulic brakes. Modulation could certainly be better, but they do the job very well. And if you need to stop the bike fast, they will do it. The motor is a Bafang BBS HD. The bracket size is 120 millimeters. The bottom bracket itself is 100 millimeters, but you need the extra width in order to clear the chain stays. Ensuring you get the correct width of bottom bracket is one of the key decisions to make when ordering a Bafang kit. It has been run at 30 amps and 52 volts, 50 amps and 52 volts, and 50 amps at 72 volts. It has been through snow, rain, mud, and even rivers with no issues whatsoever. I have a couple of batteries that I'm using right now, depending on how I want to ride. At the moment, it is cold and conditions are not suitable for maximum speed, so I have a 52 volt battery with the 25 amp hour capacity in use. For 72 volts, I'm using a lithium polymer battery, which packs a massive punch thanks to the high performance of the Turn G Graphene Panther cells. Even with the throttle wide open, there is minimal voltage sag. The drawback is the range is about half that of the 52 volt pack. Being able to switch between the two is very useful depending on whether I need the extra range or I want the incredible speed and acceleration that comes with the 72 volts. The gearing is a one to one ratio with a 42T Lecky bling ring to a 42T on the rear cassette. I have arranged the rear cassette so the chain line is much better. This particular one is a Sunrise cassette that the bike came with, so nothing fancy. If I used a narrower chain, I could access smaller gears, but that would lead to more rapid heat buildup in the motor. I must admit I'm getting quite the collection of tyres right now. In the summer I was using these smoother tyres with a lot of success. I also have a set of knobbies that came with the bike, which after thousands of kilometres are getting a bit worn down, especially the rear. Right now the bike is rocking these studded ones and they have given me awesome traction on icy roads and kept me out and about in some pretty gnarly road conditions. I ordered the ASI controller because I destroyed the firmware on my stock one. It's hard to overstate the difference that this bike has gone through from running it as a stock BBS HD to the 72 volt 3000 watts that it runs now. This controller is the absolute key component of the bike to illustrate the difference that this controller makes, let's compare some footage of the BBS HD running stock at 52 volts and 30 amps, and at 72 volts and 50 amps with field weakening. This is one of the steepest residential streets where I live.
people just looked at the footage here, they probably wouldn't think it was the same bike. So that's a quick overview of the bike as to where it is now in terms of its setup. I'm going to go over some of the questions I get asked most often in the comments and on forums on running the bike at 72 volts. I've had a few people assure me that I'm going to destroy the various components with the power that I'm running on a daily basis. All mechanical parts will eventually wear out and fail, and mine probably quicker than most, but I'm not regularly destroying parts of the bike, even at 72 volts. If we look at the rear cassette, it is the same stock Sunrace cassette that the bike came with. There are a few nicks on the cogs, which likely occurred when I was shifting gears earlier on with rather poor chain line. The large 42 tooth looks in good nick. I can't see much evidence of sharking on the teeth. It has done thousands of kilometres, and I expect it to do thousands more. The item I have found myself replacing the most has probably been the brake pads. I've also replaced the rear rotor once. I think I've gone through maybe five sets of pads, and it's the rear set that seems to go first. Although since I got the suspension forks, I've been a bit more aggressive about using the front brake, and they seem to last longer now. I was quite prepared to replace the rear derailleur, as it does take a bit of a beating, but it seems to be doing okay still. Somewhere in the teeth, but nothing too crazy. I did have to do some work on the set screw to get it working once I moved the cassette around. Considering how many kilometres the bike has done and the kind of power it's been subjected to, I think it's done pretty well. I do expect to have to replace parts, but it's not a huge monthly expense, and I'm certainly not going through multiple drive trains a year. Even if I did have to replace the derailleur every year, it would be about the same cost as a single tank of gas in most North American cars. The short answer is no. I don't go through chains on a weekly or even monthly basis. I'm sure that I will wear them out faster due to the higher power levels, but it's not something I think about when I'm out riding. I broke the chain a few times when I first got my BBS HD, and it was always when I was trying to get the bike to go fast in the wrong gear. I quickly realised this and changed my riding style to prevent it happening. Some chains are simply not strong enough for e-bike use. I now use KMC chains because they last for me. When I first jumped up to 50 amps, I had a chain come apart in four places all over the path, but it was a chain that had over 5,000 kilometres already on it. That was a fun half hour sat in the dirt, joining enough chain together to get the bike home. So right now I use KMC 6 to 8 speed chain, which is much thicker. It's been no issues for about 2,000 kilometres now. It does effectively make it a single speed bike, but seeing as how fast it goes, that's not really a problem. I check the chain regularly with the tool to ensure that it's not stretched and that it's holding up well. I get asked this question a lot by people thinking of upgrading the performance of their BBS HD, so I'm going to spend a bit of time explaining why I don't think this will be the case with my bike. Running the BBS HD at this level of power is a balancing act between speed and reliability. I've been riding at 50 amps with the ASI controller for about six months. Most of my rides have involved severe gradients and I am yet to need to replace the nylon gear. I don't think it's luck either. I simply haven't got the motor hot enough to cause it to fail. I'd say the severest test I subjected the bike to was when I rode out to the local bike ranch in 30 degree temperatures. The footage playing is from this ride. It was a 15 minute trip and finished with a 2 km part up a 9-10% to grade hill. After I stopped, I felt the motor, and it was hot, as in I would have burned my hand if I wanted to do so. I'd say it was between 60 and 70 degrees centigrade but the gear came through. So far the riding I have done at 72 volts in the snow and up some 15% grade hills left it cool enough to hold my hand on. I don't have a temperature probe installed so I can't give precise numbers though. It just goes to show that if you allow the motor to do what it wants to do, which is spin fast, then you should be okay. The situation is greatly helped by the controller I'm using and a feature it has called field weakening which allows the motor to obtain a much higher RPM than otherwise possible. 
rather than try to use this increased RPM to go for speed, I'm using it to gear the bike so that the motor spins fast most of the time. That limits heat buildup within the motor. So field weakening allows a DC motor to achieve a higher RPM. If people want a video explaining field weakening, I can do so at a later date. Field weakening is very useful in the balancing act of speed and reliability because it lets you hit the speeds you want with a much lower gear ratio. I use a 1 to 1 ratio and get sustained speeds on the flat of 50 kph at 52 volts and 65 kph at 72 volts. Up a 10% hill I can get about 40 kph at 52 volts and 55 kph at 72 volts. These kind of speeds are not possible at that gear ratio without some field weakening to boost RPMs. So I have this steel gear that Luna developed and I'm going to assume that the reason that Luna developed a steel gear is because their customers are melting their nylon gears with their ludicrous 50 amp controller. Feel free to correct me on this but as far as I'm aware the only difference from a stock Bafang controller is that it has better FETs allowing it to push 50 amps into the BBS HD. It has no field weakening so the kind of high RPMs to get 50 kph with a 1 to 1 gear ratio are not attainable. My BBS HD with field weakening reaches over 11,000 RPMs on a 52 volt battery and without field weakening it would be peaking at around 9,000 RPMs. So that's 18% greater maximum RPM than a lunar controller can achieve. That translates into 18% less speed with the ludicrous controller which does not have the field weakening. But people want to go faster than the maximum RPM of their motor will allow in a 1 to 1 gear ratio. So in order to do so, the temptation is to shift into a higher gear. That gets more speed, but as this increases, it increases the work the motor has to do to spin. The effect of which is to lower the RPMs of the motor. The power needed to spin the motor faster is still being fed in but the motor is now struggling to reach higher RPMs because the resistant forces it has to overcome, particularly with bigger bikes, are much greater. So if all these amps of electrical power that the lunar controller is pushing are not being expended in moving the motor, they have to do something. And they do. They make the motor hot, very hot. And this is the heat that ultimately melts the nylon gear. There is a reason that when Luna ship their bikes with the Ludicus controller, they lock out the smallest gears in the rear cassette. It's because they know that if you try to use them and get more speed, the lifespan of the nylon gear is likely measured in miles. So I have this steel gear, and if I do melt the nylon one, I'll give it a go. It's just that I don't expect that I will need to use it. I can see why Luna developed the gear, I like the idea that their controller fits in the same space that the original does, but I'm not going to use it because, as cool as it looks, it lacks any of the features that a modern controller should have. There's no easy communication, updating or programming via Bluetooth, there's no field weakening, no data logging, limited configuration parameters, and it has the same kind of agricultural method of delivering power that the stock controller did. So let's hypothesize a bit. If I can run my BBS HD with an ASI controller at 52 volts for 2 kilometers up a 10% hill at the end of a 20 minute ride and get it to 60 to 70 degrees and it not melt the nylon gear, how hot does the BBS HD need to get to melt it? I decided to use Google. Google tells me that nylon melts at 220 degrees centigrade. Logic says that the failure of a gear would occur at the softening stage, so a lower temperature. But still, Bafang and other users of these gears presumably pick nylon because it has a high melting point. So the Luna Ludicrous bikes are running a steel gear instead, and it takes away the nylon gear, so less issues with failing gears. But it's also going to enable people to run their motors at temperatures in excess of 100 degrees C, trying to get faster speeds. To me, that is ludicrous, and it's not the way to treat your motor. So, if a steel gear is needed in order to subject the motor to temperatures that it was never designed to experience, does it not stand to reason that other parts of the motor are not going to be super happy above 100 degrees C either? So anyway, back to the question. 
No, I don't expect to use the steel gear. Never say never, because there are no guarantees when you exceed the manufacturer's specs by as much as I do. And if I wreck the gear, I'll put in this nice steel one. I just think that the BBS HD does far better with a decent external controller running the show and gearing to keep the temperatures low than sticking in a steel gear that allows the motor to be run at temperatures well in excess of 100. I don't want this to come off as bashing Luna. I like the bikes they make and they're definitely one of the better options if you want a complete e-bike with any degree of power. One of my favorites is this one they do for kind of going out in the bush with loads of racks and fenders and they go hunting, that kind of thing. If I didn't enjoy building bikes, I would buy one probably, but I would get a stock one and save my money on the ludicrous option and wire in an ASI. It requires a bit more work to get the bike looking nice because you have to mount it. But ultimately, you're going to get much better performance and a better ride quality and a quieter bike because you can still run it with the nylon gear. So that's all for now. This will be the last major video I do on the Fatboy for some time. Lots of projects coming up though, including designing some bike lights and the Back 2000 build with the new NXT display from ERT. As usual, if people have any questions or want to set me straight on anything, drop me a comment. Also still have the Egg Rider V2 to give away at 1000 subscribers and every comment you put down gets you an entry. Cheers.